Barro is the most promising scientist uh, according to the Plasmid Conference in, I don't know, 2018, was it, or 17? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know I had that title, but it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> title. <laughs> um, yeah. So I will just start sharing my screen. So we, yeah. No? Um, here we go. Ooh, here. Okay. Um, so can you see the presentation, I guess? Yes. Okay, okay. So um, I'm going to talk today about, um, yeah, about two things, basically. Um, the spread and the evolution of plasmid-mediated anti antibiotic resistance in hospitalized patients, in the gut microbiota of hospitalized patients. Um, okay, we have uh, already, heard quite a lot about how plasmid mediated resistance evolves. Briefly, there's transfer of conjugative plasmids that um, distribute uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, mechanisms across different bacteria, but acquiring a plasmid may um, be really useful if there is antibiotic present, but it may be costly if there is no antibiotic because plasmids um, tend to produce physiological alterations in the bacterial host that may lead to a fitness cost. And then this is not a static picture, but over time, plasmid and bacteria can evolve and, and the cost can be compensated. The plasmid copy number can be modulated. Different things can happen that um, fine tune the, the relationship between bacteria and, and the plasmid, right? So we are <laughs> trying to understand the, um, evolution of plasmid mediated resistance using uh, carbapenemase producing enterobacteria. So carbapenemase producing enterobacteria are a group of, of, of bacteria that um, such as Clipsilla pneumonia or E. coli that carry, um, that are able to resist this, this car carbapenem group of antibiotics that are last resort antibiotics that are usually um, used only in multidrug resistant infections in, in hospitals. So these, uh, these group of bacteria uh, represent a, a, an important threat to, to patients, right? And what is important to us is that in general, these carbapenemases are the beta-lactamase type enzymes that degrade carbapenems are usually encoded on conjugative plasmids. So for the last six years, I guess we have been studying quite a lot a, a specific carb, uh, carbapenemase that is OXA48, which was described um, in the early 2000s in, in Turkey, and but it's now distributed worldwide. And it's really important. I mean, it's really a good system for us because this carbapenemase is almost every single time encoded in an, in an almost identical ink L plasmid that is P oxa 48 and the P oxa 48 like plasmids, but they're really similar. So the, the, this beauty here is the, is the P oxa 48 plasmid, which is um, it conjugate, it conjugates quite a lot all these conjugative genes. It, it carries different um, accessory genes, but well, it carries the carbapenemase uh, gene right here, okay? So um, an important thing about, about this plasmid is that it associates with high risk uh, clones of mainly Clefcilla pneumonia belonging to the sequence types 11, 15, 101, et cetera, okay? So we wanted to understand or to study the evolution of these um, POXA48 mediated antibiotic resistance in, the, in hospitals. And to do that, um, I have been collaborating quite a lot with, with people, or, uh, especially with Rafael Canton, that is the head of the uh, microbiology service in the Ramon y Cajal Hospital in Madrid. So basically, uh, Rafael, uh, before I started working in the hospital, uh, was performing a large project where they basically, they were sampling every single patient that was admitted to uh, two different wards, uh, uh, medical ward, gastroenterology and neumology, and two different surgical wards, neurosurgery and urology in the, in the hospital. So every single patient that was admitted was sampled, looking for ESBLs and carbapenemase producing enterobacteria, just to, just to find a colonization in the gut microbiota of these patients, right? So over two years, more than 9,000 patients were sampled, and um, almost 3,000 um, swabs taken. And out of those samples, 250 P OXA48 carrying enterobacteria were isolated from 105 patients. But the good thing about agnosis is that once um, a patient was sampled positive, 
the patient would will be sampled every single week after that until discharge from the hospital. And that's good because that will generate temporal series of PEOXA48 carrier enterobacteria that are um, really useful for us to study the evolution of, of the plasmid and in the gut microbiota of the patients, okay? So um, I will talk about the spread and the evolution of the plasmid. I will start talking about how the plasmid spreads in the hospital. And this is work done or led by Ricardo Leon um, in the lab. So basically we started studying the epidemiology of carbapenemase producing enterobacteria in the hospital. There are basically two layers of complexity that, that, that you may or you want to take into account. So basically there's what we call the between patient transfer and, and uh, that basically is the transfer of the carbapenemase producing enterobacteria between different patients. And that can happen um, directly or indirectly through, through the hospital staff or, or surfaces and, and so on. But there's a second layer of complexity in the epidemiology of these, these uh, bacteria in the hospital There is the within patient transfer. So patients are usually or frequently colonized by these carbapenemase producing enterobacteria in hospitals. And once the patients have been colonized, since the carbapenemases are encoded on conjugative plasmids, they can spread horizontally through conjugation, generating new carbapenemase producing enterobacteria. So this is uh, also an important part of the epidemiology of these bacteria. So, okay, so we, we, went, we used the uh, data from our noses, and as I said, we found 105 patients um, that were colonized by PEOXA48 producing enterobacteria over the study period. And, and, and that's what I uh, represent here. Every uh, single um, row represents a patient. The color segment indicates the length of a stay from admission to discharge of the patient in the hospital. Uh, in the different words, okay? And the, if there's a black outline uh, in, the, in the color, it means that from that particular patient, more than one uh, different PEOXA48 carrying clones, meaning from different species, um, were isolated, which is kind of an indicator of potential events of within pa patient plasmid transfer, okay? But that's just an indicator. Okay, so what we did is we took um, the 250 isolates that were recovered from this collection and, and they basically kind of look like this. So this is the number of isolates um, by the month of the study and the different colors indicate the species to which the isolate belong. And as you can see, uh, the most common species is Klebsiella pneumoniae, and that's not surprising because as I said, uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae is usually associated to this plasmid, but we also found quite a lot of E. coli and other um, enterobacteria species associated to the plasmid. Uh, in the gut of these patients, okay? So we took the 250 isolates and we sequenced their genomes, both by um, Illumina and also for a few of them uh, using long read technology. And uh, what we did is we kind of basically use the, the um, approaches that Alicia has, has just introduced of trying to use epidemiological models uh, with the collaboration of Ben Cooper from the University of Oxford. So basically what we did is we feed all the genomic information from the 250 isolates and the epidemiological information from the 105 patients to try to reconstruct um, the potential routes or, or the potential events of between patient, uh, between patient transfer um, of PEOXA48 carrying clones. Uh, well, basically this is kind of the same uh, figure as before, but now what, uh, like on top of the patients or the length of the stay of the patients, there are some arrows that basically indicate these potential events of, uh, of between patient plasmid transfer. The um, width of the, of the arrow indicates the probability assigned by the model to the uh, transfer event and the color of the arrows indicate the, um, the clone or the sequence type involved in, the, in that transfer event, okay? I mean, this, is, this has already been published, so if, yeah, I won't um, go into much detail. Um, if, if you're interested, you can, you can check it out. And um, basically what we found is that we found quite frequent transfer events in, in patients. Um, ST11 of Clifton pneumonia was involved in transfer events in all the wards. Neurosurgery ward was the, the one with a higher or the highest frequency of transfers and the highest probability also. And although most of the transfer events were uh, driven by Klebsiella, we also found that an E. coli um, spreading around uh, or, or transferring around patients with this plasma. 
some patients may act as super spreaders. Okay, we there's there are really interesting um, epidemiological uh, uh, data that we got out from from this analysis. Okay, so the plasmid can transfer. Uh, so the plasmid carrying bacteria can transfer between patients. Okay, but we were also or we were really interested in the in the in the transfer within the patients. Okay, so basically the results kind of suggest that uh, since there, there was kind of a high frequency of patients that were colonized by two different species of Pioxa 48 uh, carrying bacteria, this may be an indication of within patient transfer. But and there's also another possibility that, it, that is that this is just caused by independent colonization events, by independent bacteria carrying the plasma. So to kind of tell these two possibilities possibilities apart, what we did is we went and, 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 and analyzed the genetic sequence of the plasmid of Pioxa 48 in, in all the isolates. So basically what we wanted to, to do is to try to find the specific genetic signatures in the plasmid that will help us um, confirm if those were cases of within patient plasmid transfer, okay? So to do that, what we did is we took the, the sequence of the, of the plasmid and we construct, uh, we compare the core plasmid sequence, which is good because um, in most of the strains, the core is really well conserved in terms of, of, of the fragment of the plasmid. So 90% is, is conserved in most of the strains. So we, in these strains, we compare the sequence of this core. And um, basically that is what I represent here. So the outer ring indicates the genus of the isolate, uh, the second circle indicated the name of the isolate from which the plasmid is recovered. And then the remaining circles indicate the presence or absence of certain SNPs that we found in the core region. The first thing that I have to highlight here is that 80% of the plasmid were completely identical in the core region. So you can't really tell, I mean, you can really study any tr transmission events there because they are exactly the same. But for some of them, we found mutations. And what, and what we did is we tried to find cases where this traceable plasmid variant that carried specific SNPs in the core uh, region uh, were present in different bacterial clones. And, and, and why is that? Because we thought that if, we, if the isolation of different bacterial species carrying the same traceable plasmid variant happened in the, in the same patient, in a single patient, that is a very strong indication of within patient plasmid transfer, okay? So that we found four cases of these uh, potential um, traceable uh, plasmid transfer events in the gut of patients. And um, this is, well, again, this, is, this has been recently published. I, 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 I won't take much longer in this, but basically what we found is in, for every single case where a mutation could tell us if there is a within patient plasmid transfer, we found uh, these plasmid transfer events in patients where, for example, this patient here carries a specific plasmid variant, and in the six different isolates belonging to four different species that were recovered from the gut of, the, of, of this patient, the exact same plasmid variant was present. And the, that plasmid variant was not present in any other patient in the study. So this basically means that the plasmid is being transferred between these clones in the gut microbiota of the patient. Another really interesting thing that we learned is that um, this high conjugation in the gut of, of patients also led to long-term Pioxa 48 gut carriers. Because take, for example, this patient here was colonized by an SD11 of Klebsiella. A few weeks later, that particular ST was gone, but the same plasmid variant was present in a different E. coli in the gut microbiota. And then this, the patient was discharged and admitted again more than a year later. And the same specific um, plasmid variant was present now in a third, in a, third different clone in a, in a different E. coli clone. But given that this plasmid variant has this specific traceable uh, mutation, this means that this patient has been um, colonized over more than a year from, with, with this particular plasmid, right? Which is important because now it means that these carbapenemase um, encoding plasmids may, may be moving towards the community and, and, and um, colonizing other, uh, other people outside the hospital, right? Okay, so that's the first part of the talk, but now I want to present some new data that in which we are kind of studying and not only the, the spread of the, of the plasmid, but also the evolution of the plasmid in the gut microbiota of patients. So this is work led by, by Javier in the lab. And, and basically what Javier did is he kind of took the, the um, uh, sequences of Pioxa 48 plasmid and, and did a an more in-depth analysis, looking not only at the core region, but 
at the complete plasmid sequence and comparing all plasmids with each other. And he, he with this approximation, he, he um, basically identified more plasmid variants up to 35 P OXA48 plasmid variants isolated from these different patients in the hospital. And um, using these um, variants, we wanted to understand if, if uh, we could somehow trace the evolution of the plasmid in the gut of patients. So the first thing that we did is um, to do that is we kind of selected uh, 14 of these variants that had kind of representative mutations of, of the entire collection that I represent here with, with these uh, letters here from A to N. And uh, each one, as you can see, uh, carries either a deletion, an insertion, a different um, type of mutations, needs synonymous or not synonymous mutations, um, intergenic mutations, et cetera, right? So what we thought is like, okay, if these mutations are associated with the evolution of antibiotic resistance in, 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 in the hospital, uh, one would expect that they may have an impact in, in uh, plasmid associated traits that may be relevant for the evolution of resistance. So what we did is we took the 14 plasmid variants and the first a series of experiments, we just said, okay, so let's put them in an isogenic um, bacterial background and let's see what they do. What, let, let me, let's uh, look at the plasmid associated uh, traits. So we took the 14 um, var variants and put them in an E. coli strain. And we measure uh, for this collection. Um, well, we sequence them all just to be sure that they're completely isogenic apart from the presence of, of the different plasmid variants. And uh, basically what we do, we measure fitness using growth curves and competition experiments, antibiotic resistant levels, um, conjugation rate and plasmid copy number to see um, if we could find any differences among them. So the first thing that I present here is the fitness effects here. I'm presenting the relative area under the growth curve um, relative to the plasmid uh, free strain. But we have also done competition experiments and these two basically correlate perfectly. So it's kind of the same data. So I present here, so the plasmid free is one and then all the different plasmid carrying clones. The one that, it, that it's um, highlighted in gray here is this plasmid variant C. And that's because that's the most common plasmid variant in the hospital, 60% of the isolates carry this particular plasmid variant. And as you can see, the plasmid tend to be quite costly in, in J53 in, in this E. coli strain, but as you can also see, there are quite a lot of differences. So the most common plasmid variant is costly, and there is there are other uh, variants that are at least as cost, uh, produce as, as high cost as this one. But there there are a couple of variants that are almost cost free in in J53. One of these, the first one, um, carries a deletion that a small deletion that that inactivates the antimicrobial resistant gene, the OXA48 gene, and you can see that here. So this is the ertapenem resistant level of the different plasmid variant uh, carrying um, clones. And as you can see, uh, so the plasmid confer resistant to ertapenem, but in this particular um, clone here, it does not because the, the gene is deleted and that's associated with, a, with an increase in fitness in J53. The second variant that um, also seems to be ameliorating the cost, um, uh, so also carries a deletion, and this deletion is a large one, and it's going to delete some of the conjugation associated genes. And as you can see, this is the conjugation rates for its different variant, and this this one is not conjugating at all because it doesn't um, carry the genes anymore. But and as you can also see, there are some differences in in conjugation rates in the remaining in the remaining clones. And finally, when we look at plasmid copy number again, so the plasmid copy number uh, it was about. Uh, between 2.5 or, or and 4 in most of the of the um, for most of the variants, but there was one variant with an increased um, plasmid copy number, which presented a mutation upstream the the replication in initiation um, gene, which could be responsible for this, and and that one produced kind of a large cost and, and an, a large or a high resistance level. Okay. So this, so, so the, the thing here or the take home message is like, okay, different variants produce different effects and they may be associated with the evolution of persistence. And actually the most striking effect that we kind of observe is that um, there's a quite a, 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 an important trade off between fitness and resistance for P oxa 48 carrying um, uh, J53 clones. So basically this is the resistance level measure in IC90 of er ertapenem. And this is the relative fitness, um, well, or the relative area under the growth curve 
measuring fitness. And as you can see, there is a trade off between uh, bacteria carrying this different plasmid variant uh, being present in a higher level of resistance, but also a uh, um, higher fitness cost in the absence of antibiotics, and also bacteria where the antibiotic resistance level is decreased or, or, or abolished and present a high fitness, which kind of indicate that probably the expression of the resistance mechanism is, is uh, driving the, the cost in day 53, at least. But can also be really important for the evolution of, of um, PIOXA48 mediated resistance in vivo. Now, if this translates to translates or, or stands in, in the in vivo in the wild type uh, clones. So that's what we're doing, what we are doing now. So we are trying to see if um, what we have learned from this uh, E. coli uh, host background um, applies for the wild type uh, bacteria clones that carry the plasmid in the patient. So we are looking for intrapatient plasmid evolution. And to do that, what, what we are doing is um, looking for patients where we can find more or with more than one PIOXA48 isolate has been recovered over time. Sorry. Um, also that the same clone is present in the gut of the patients over time. And we can look at that just looking at the gen uh, genomic sequences, but also that where this in the same clone, we find different plasmid variants over time. So meaning a clone that seemed to be colonizing the patient over time, the plasmid variant changes in, in that clone and present a different mut a mutation that may be involved in the evolution of, uh, of, of plasmid mediated resistance. So we found three cases where, where or three patients uh, with these um, characteristics that I, I, I mean, I'm not gonna go into detail because I, I don't have enough time, but basically we have patients with these conditions. And uh, we also, for these patients, we have the antibiotic uh, treatments over time in the hospital. So we can link this potential evolution with, with the antibiotic pressure. And what is difficult to do this is, is the technical part, because when you work with wild type strains, it's not as working with, with the lab strains where it's, it's really easy to genetically manipulate, right? So what we're doing now is we, we take all these wild type strains and, and first we remove the plasmid, the PIOXA48 plasmid from them. And we use a CRISPR-Cas um, based system that, that um, uh, David Bicar from the Pasteur Institute is helped us um, to develop. So we can cure the, the plasmid from the clone. And once we have cured the plasmid, what we do is we resequence the genome just to make sure that no mutation, no significant mutations have accumulated during the process. And then what we, what we can do is to put back the plasmid, the plasmid that that particular clone was carrying and the alternative plasmid that was present in the same clone at different time points, okay? So the, then we can compare the effect of the plasmid in an isogenic wild type background which is kind of the, of the key uh, part of the experiment. And then we measure resistance, plasmid uh, cost by growth curves and competitions and plasmid copy number and, and look at, at, at that. Um, and basically that's what we're doing now. And um, uh, we have really exciting results. And they're not ready to be presented yet, but, but we are almost there. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully they will be, they will be able to, to, to have them soon. And uh, yeah, that basically that's everything I wanted to, to present today. And uh, I want to thank all the, the people in, in the lab, the, the different uh, people involved in the different parts of the project that I already um, mentioned during the talk and well, the collaborators and, and funding bodies. And if, if, if you have um, any question, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. <clears throat> Well, Alvaro, this is awesome. And it gets, every yeah. time you present, it gets better. <laughs> we're, we're, quite, we're really excited about this part. It's true that we've been working with this system for a long time, and it's true that it's, I mean, we are quite excited. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. are there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Is there, there is Cornelia with a hand. Cornelia. Yeah. Um, Hi, Cornelia. Hi. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> to hear your story. And um, I have a question concerning, do you have a hypothesis from where in the first place these uh, plasmids came from to the gut? Because uh, I have an idea. <laughs> I mean, we know, uh, we kind of know that our hospital is, is colonized by, by these um, mm -hmm. um, 
enterobacterial, especially Klebsiella pneumonia is really good at surviving in the hospital, in the environment, mm, yeah. in, the, in the environment, right? So we know that the plasmid is kind of colonized by, by POXA48 carrying Klebsiella. So what it seems to happen is that when patients are, are admitted to the hospital, because I mean, and we can see that in, with our data, because since patients are sampled over time, um, uh, they were sampled at, at admission and then another time, and then if they were positive, they would, they they were sampled again and again. So a, a lot of the, a lot of the times, the, the first sample was negative, but then the the next sample uh, was positive, meaning that we think that most of the colonizations occurred in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So so it's, because, it's, yeah, because you first said that uh, uh, they were sampling the people at admission. And those that were positive were followed over time. So that's why I thought, well, yeah. maybe this would be quite, uh, because many of these isolates that you listed that carry the plasmid are typical plant associated bacteria. Uh, I guess you haven't heard my talk, but uh, I, I think. Yeah, I did, I did, I did. I did. Yeah, uh, but I think that. Uh, I believe that there might be really an overlooked link from the bacteria associated to uh, produce uh, because they are arriving in the gut uh, well protected uh, from the uh, vex layer. And at least in our collection, we have a few that carry OXA48. That's why okay. I thought. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I... I see that now. I mean, Teresa from the Teresa Coque from from the hospital is doing a huge effort in sampling not only patients but everything in the hospital mm -hmm. in the ICUs especially mm -hmm. and the kind of the ecology of the sinks especially and, and yeah, yeah. surfaces. But the, 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 the ecology of antimicrobial system plasmids there is is is, is kind of mind blowing. So so yeah. But but what you are. I mean, it, it's interesting, and and it, and it this may would, be the case. this would be mainly interesting for those patients who have uh, the plasmid already at admission. Definitely. And I have to double check because it might be that we have OXA forty eight also on ink and, for instance. Okay. Okay. That would so, be interesting. Yeah, I have to to double check this, but that's why I was uh, very okay. curious. Yeah, because in our in our case in our study, every single I mean, there was a perfect correlation between OXA48, or almost perfect correlation between OXA48 and uh, the Inkel plasmid yeah, yeah. OXA48. Yeah, but basically it's in literature. You always find it in Inkel or, I mean, in, ST, in E. coli, ST38, it is inserted in the chromosome. But, uh, oh, I never seen no, But we just recently plasmid. sequenced an ink and plasmid and it if I'm not mistaken, it has a OXA48. So I double check it and I will contact you. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, send us an email, please. It's really <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah we're okay. POXA48 aficionados. Uh, yeah. Alicia and I. <laughs> okay, so, thanks. Well, it was really nice talk. Thank you, Connie. So now